Welcome to Poetry and Poets with Suzanne Stradling Collins, the director of the Apache County Library District. Today we're going to talk about Lawrence Ferlinghetti. He passed away just two weeks, a little bit over two weeks ago, and he was 101 years old when he passed. Very close to 102. He was born 24th March 1919, so he didn't quite make it to his 102nd birthday. He was born in the state of New York. Um, his father died while his mother was carrying him. Shortly after he was born, his mother ended up in a mental institution. There were other siblings and she just couldn't handle everything that was happening. His aunt did take him in and took him to Paris. And so he was, the first language he learned to speak was French actually. And he lived in Paris some time with her and then they came back to New York. At one point, his aunt could not care for him, so he ended up in foster care and an orphanage. Uh, she did was able to take him out of that situation, bring him back into her life. And she was uh, teaching French to a, to a young woman in a wealthy family. And the wealthy family basically adopted him. Um, because of that, he ended up with a very good education. Uh, before his education, he was in part of, he was in the U.S. Navy, and he was a skipper of a subcarrier, submarine chaser. I'm not exactly sure what those do, <laughs> but that's what he did. And he was part of the Normandy invasion. Um, he ended up with a master's in English literature from Columbia University, and his doctorate was in comparative literature, and he received that at the University of Paris. As he was traveling to Paris, he met his future wife on the boat, and she was headed to Paris to study also. They were divorced eventually, but before that they did have two children. Um, Ferlinghetti himself did not publish a great deal of poetry. He was very influential in helping other poets to publish, especially those that were known as the Beat Generation. Um, Poets like Allen Ginsberg and William S. Burroughs. Um, Jack Kerouac was a good friend of his uh, on the road, Jack Kerouac. So the Beat Generation was publishing or working mainly in the 1950s. And they, their writing, their ideas were those of nonconformity and of spontaneous creativity. And so they caused quite a stir at that time. Ferlinghetti is also known for his bookstore, City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco. In 1953 is when the bookstore opened. It is still open. It has been declared a historical building. It's on the historical registry. Um, tour buses used to stop at City Lights Bookstore so that they could see what beat poets might be there who might be visiting. Um, people don't stop quite as often anymore, but it is still famous. In 1955, he started a publishing company and he started to publish um, many of these poets. In, it was also, City Lights Bookstore is also the first bookstore that was exclusively selling paperbacks. Of course, in the 50s, paperbacks weren't considered to be anything of value pretty much. They were supposed to be throwaway, something kind of easy to see, sent to the soldiers, those kind of things. And so it was unusual for him to be doing this, too, to publish quality materials in paperback. He said about poetry, one of the things he felt about poetry was that it shouldn't be for the elite. It shouldn't be for those who have those degrees and stuff, but that sh anyone should be able to read and understand poetry. So I have two quotes that I want to read that he talked about poetry. The first one says, if you would be a poet, create works capable of answering the challenge of apocalyptic times, even if this means sounding apocalyptic. You are Whitman, you are Poe, you are Mark Twain, you are Emily Dickinson, and Edna St. Vincent Millay. You are Neruda, and Mayakovsky, and Pasolini. You are an American, or a non-American. You can conquer the conquerors with words. And that comes from his poetry book from Poetry as Insurgent Art. He also said, Poets, come out of your closets. Open your windows. Open your doors. You have been holed up too long in your closed worlds. 
Poetry should transport the public to higher places than other wills can carry it. So he was a champion of poetry, a champion of getting words out there that had meaning and strength. In 19, I think it was 19, I don't know what year. I don't remember the year exactly. He published Allen Ginsberg's Howl, and he was then arrested for publishing works of obscenity. It, uh, he had talked to um, the ACLU before he published the book and said, will you represent me if I'm arrested? And they said, yes, we will. And he was, he was arrested, and it did go to trial, and um, he was not convicted, and the book was not considered to be obscenity. It's a landmark case that allowed other things to be published, that allow publishing to happen today. Um, so he was, he was in the right place at a, a lot of the right times, I guess you could say, and had a real influence on others. Um, in 1997, I was lucky enough to go to City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco. When I got there, my main reason for going there was because I knew that Richard Brodigan had hung out there. And so that was my pilgr pilgrimage to see where Brodigan had been. And when I got to the store, I just happened to ask a clerk or something about Ferlinghetti, and they said, well, he's upstairs. And if you'd like to visit with him, just head on up the stairs. And I was like, really? <laughs> I might get to see him. And so I did head up the stairs. And uh, he was extremely gracious. I had bought a copy in his store. This is his most famous book. It's called The Coney Island of the Mind. It has been translated into nine languages and has sold at least a million copies. Right now, if you go on Amazon and try to purchase it, you will have to wait until April. Uh, even our booksellers as a library trying to get a hold of it, they're backlogged until April. And that's because he just passed away. And so we do not have a copy of this in any of our libraries at present. We have one on order and it will be available in our library system. This is my copy. Um, and it has been signed by Lawrence Ferlinghetti. And so he signed it uh, in March of 97 with my name on it and he did write that it was in City Lights Bookstore. So this one's dear to me One of the things that I regret I did ask him a little bit about himself But mainly I wanted to know about Richard Brodigan So I spent the few minutes that I got to visit with him talking about Richard Brodigan, which I don't regret But I also wished I had talked more to him about him The poem that I'm going to read part of it's quite long many of his poems are long is called I am waiting uh, you may not agree with his politics, you may not agree with all that he has to say, but I love that poets say so many things. And as he said, you know, we this might be a way for us to get ideas out there. So I value that he did speak his mind and his truths, at least. This is called I Am Waiting. I am waiting for my case to come up, and I am waiting for a rebirth of wonder. And I am waiting for someone to really discover America and wail. And I am waiting for the discovery of a new symbolic Western frontier. And I am waiting for an American eagle to really spread its wings and straighten up and fly right. And I am waiting for the age of anxiety to drop dead. And I am waiting for the war to be fought, which will make the world safe for anarchy. And I am waiting for the final withering away of all governments. And I am perpetually awaiting a rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for the second coming, and I am waiting for a religious revival to sweep through the state of Arizona, and I am waiting for the grapes of wrath to be stored, and I am waiting for them to prove that God really is American, and I am seriously waiting for Billy Graham and Elvis Presley to exchange roles seriously, and I am waiting to see God on television piped into church altars if only they can find the right channel to tune in on and I am waiting for the Last Supper to be served again with a strange new appetizer, and I am perpetually awaiting a rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for my number to be called, and I am waiting for the living end, and I am waiting for Dad to come home, his pockets full of irradiated silver dollars, and I am waiting for the atomic tests to end, and I am waiting happily for things to get much worse before they improve. 
and I am waiting for the Salvation Army to take over, and I am waiting for the human crowd to wander off a cliff somewhere, clutching its on atomic umbrella, and I am waiting for Ike to act, and I am waiting for the meek to be blessed and inherit the earth without taxes, and I am waiting for forests and animals to reclaim the earth as theirs, and I am waiting for a way to be devised to destroy all nationalisms without killing anybody. And I am waiting for linnets and planets to fall like rain. And I am waiting for lovers and weepers to lie down together again in a new rebirth of wonder. I am waiting to get some imitations of immortality by recollecting my early childhood. And I am waiting for the green mornings to come again. Youth's dumb green fields come back again. And I am waiting for some strains of unpremeditated art to shape my typewriter. And I am waiting to write the great indelible poem. And I am waiting for the last long careless rapture. And I am perpetually waiting for the fleeing lovers on the Grecian urn to catch each other up at last and embrace. And I am waiting perpetually and forever a renaissance of wonder. And so I ask you to think about what you're waiting for. And I hope that whatever it is, that you're waiting for a rebirth of wonder also, along with Berlin Getty. And tune in next week. I'm not sure who will study, but we'll, we'll be here.